today to Let's discuss to the, the recent increase in the number of COVID-19 cases in Texas, as well as to discuss the ways that Texans can and frankly need uh, to step up and work collaboratively to make sure that we respond to this increase. Now, from the beginning of our response to COVID-19, I have repeated several guidelines. First, decisions about how to respond to COVID-19 will be based upon data as well as advice from doctors. Second, COVID-19 remains a very fast spreading virus that will remain in Texas, the United States, and across the entire world until treatments are available to mitigate it. As a result, we must find ways to return to our daily routines while also learning ways to coexist with COVID-19. Third, our early goal was to slow the spread of the coronavirus to prevent our hospitals from becoming overrun. We succeeded in that early goal by following the best practices to make sure that we did slow the spread. And as a result, we did prevent our hospitals from getting overrun. And as we gather today, hospitals continue to have abundant capacity to treat patients with COVID-19. Fourth, as we opened up from stay-at-home policies, we established safety protocols to minimize the increase of the spread of COVID-19. These protocols, which are contained in this booklet right here, they provide guidance for all Texans and all Texas businesses. If these guidelines are followed, they help to reduce the spread of COVID-19. The protocols have several core principles. If you are at risk or if you're sick, you should stay at home. You should frequently sanitize your hands. You should maintain safe distances from others when you do go out. And when you do go out, you should wear a face covering or a face mask. These strategies have proven to be effective in stopping the spread of COVID-19. Fifth, I've said all along that if the positivity rate or the hospitalization rate increase too much, we have strategies to reduce the spread of COVID-19 without having to return to stay-at-home policies. Sixth, closing down Texas again will always be the last option. Now, with that context, I want to review several key data points. They are shown in three graphs that I'm providing today. First is a graph showing the daily number of people testing positive. In the last half of May, Texas averaged about 1,500 positive cases a day. In the past five days in June, we've averaged more than 3,500 cases a day. Second is a graph showing the rise in the positivity rate. The positivity rate has gone from about 4.5% in late May to almost 9% today. Last is a graph showing the rise in hospitalizations. Hospitalizations for COVID-19 averaged just over 1,600 a day in the latter part of May. In the last four or five days, hospitalizations have averaged more than 3,200 a day. To state the obvious, COVID-19 is now spreading at an unacceptable rate in Texas, and it must be corralled. We have several strategies to reduce the spread without having to shut Texas back down. First, we need to have all Texans follow the safe protocols that we've all come to learn. Stay at home if you can sanitize your hands, try to stay six feet away from others that you're not traveling with, and if you cannot stay a safe distance, wear a face mask or a face covering. Second, appropriate authorities are increasing enforcement. For example, 
TABC is shutting down overcrowded bars that are not in compliance. Counties are closing things like river park operations that have grown too crowded. Some authorities are requiring masks in congregated areas. Third, we are surging testing in areas that may be hot spots. We are working with the CDC on this effort. Also working with us on this effort, as well as the entirety of our strategies in responding to COVID-19, are citizens from Texas who are serving in the Texas National Guard. About 3,500 of them remain in active duty service across the state of Texas, helping our state respond to the spread of COVID-19, and I thank them for their service. Fourth, we're working with hospitals to ensure that they have the ability to treat anyone who tests positive from COVID-19. And fifth, I know that some people feel that wearing a mask is inconvenient or that it is like an infringement of freedom. But I also know that wearing a mask will help us to keep Texas open because not taking action to slow the spread will cause COVID to spread even worse, risking people's lives and ultimately leading to the closure of more businesses. I encourage Texans to learn more about how you can get involved to help slow the spread of COVID-19, and you can do that online by going to open.texas.gov. Our goal is to keep Texans out of hospitals and to reduce the number of Texans who test positive. COVID hasn't suddenly gone away, but neither has our ability to slow the spread of it. Texans have already shown that we don't have to choose between jobs and health. We can have both. We can protect Texans' lives while also restoring their livelihoods. Together, we can keep Texans safe. Together, we will keep Texas wide open for business. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Hellerstedt. Thank you, Governor. Please, Texas, let's heed the wise uh, guidance that the governor has laid out. You've heard it many times before. We are at a very crucial point in time. As you can see, that the data, the trends are going up in a way that we really need to get control of. We can get control of those by using the kind of guidance that we have laid out before. So the, the governor gave a great summary of them. Uh, it's all about hygiene. If you can, in an area uh, where uh, face covering, that's a really great idea. It, it helps to stop the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we really are at a point where we need to recover what I feel was a, a sense of community that we had early on uh, in the outbreak of COVID-19. We are still all in this together, Texas, and we need to act not just to protect ourselves, but to protect the entire community. So the things that we're asking you to do will be effective. We must do them now. We must curb these trends um, uh, so that we can go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Dr. Zerwas. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for your continued uh, leadership on this. Um, uh, I think both the Commissioner and the Governor have spoke very eloquently about what the key uh, things are that we need to do in order to stay safe and to really kind of rein in the spread of uh, COVID-19. Uh, what I have spent a lot of my time on at the Governor's direction is to ensure that we have the hospital capacity uh, to meet the increasing demand that people might have as we see the spread of the disease. We are seeing that now, and we're seeing that capacity being tested. Uh, however, we continue to have uh, good, strong capacity within our health care system. You may recall uh, we laid out a, a one through five uh, level of, in terms of capacity, five being the typical capacity within the staff number of beds, and we continue to be in that place. Uh, and we continue to see uh, a, a number of patients driving the census as far as COVID goes fairly low. Now, that has continued to rise. In fact, it's risen over last week since the last time I had a chance to speak on this. Uh, but it's still a, a, a minority of the patients that are in our ICUs and in our beds. And so they aren't driving the census right now. Uh, but uh, should we not 
be able to accomplish uh, what needs to be accomplished, uh, we will see this census increase within our hospitals, and then that will drive some additional efforts that need to be made. Uh, those efforts are well in place. Uh, we've laid out a very, very uh, you know, good plan in terms of meeting what those demands are out there. One thing I would remind everybody of that the governor reminded people of not too long ago, and that was the Texas Disaster Volunteer Registry that can be found on the Department of State Health Services uh, uh, website. Uh, that's a place where uh, if you're uh, anybody that's in the healthcare field that would like to put their name in there, so in the event that we need to start drawing on volunteers for additional efforts, uh, this is the time to do that, uh, is to you know put your name in there and show where you would prefer to work and where you would be. So that's, uh, I think, uh, Governor, I think a uh, thing that we should look at. It's not uh, a, a demand right now, but uh, it's always good to be ahead of the curve. So thank you. And now Chief Nim Kidd with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. Thank you, Governor. Just a quick update on PPE and testing. You know, we've pushed out over 62 million masks to healthcare workers and first responders across the state. We have about 24 million in our warehouse and inventory with another 96 million in route. So for PPE shortages or concerns that are out there, we need to make sure that we're sharing those back. There is plenty of PPE in our inventory at this time. It's one of the few times you've heard me say that. The second is testing. We continue to do our seven-day rolling averages, about 32,000 tests a day in Texas now. We know that number may go down, Governor, because in the Houston area we've closed all of the outdoor testing sites due to severe weather there. But testing sites remain available. There are over 840 testing sites still open in the state today. Thank you. With that, we'll take a few questions. Thanks, Governor. You uh, continue to encourage people to wear masks in public, and at the same time, you talk about personal freedoms. But you and I are both old enough to remember a Texas where we were free to get behind the wheel of an uninsured vehicle, pop open a cold beer, leave our seatbelt off, and drive wherever we want. Um, and then elected leaders say, wait a minute, public safety is far more important than your personal freedoms. We're going to make it mandatory that you can no longer have those freedoms. Are you even considering uh, likening that situation with the present one? Well, where we are in this pandemic is if you look at the, the growth or even the decline in the number of people who were testing positive as well as the positivity rate uh, all the way through uh, the early part of May. Texas was moving in a, a very productive position. And then around the time of Memorial Day, there was an increase. And that increase has maintained for several weeks now, necessitating that next steps be taken. The best next steps are the ones that I, I articulated earlier with regard to different levels of enforcement, understanding this very important principle. And that is, there is a differentiation about the level of spread in different parts of the state of Texas. What may be true in Austin, Texas, is different in Austin County in the state of Texas. And we need to have latitude for that differentiation. As a result, you are seeing in some of the larger settings that have a more uh, massive spread of COVID-19, there uh, is an increased use of requiring masks, whereas in other areas of the state, uh, there is no uh, requirement of wearing masks because there is either no COVID cases or very few COVID cases. So I think maintaining a level of flexibility is important in a state the size of Texas with 254 counties, but with an emphasis wherever possible uh, to make sure that the right strategies are in place to make sure that we are slowing the spread of COVID-19. Quick, quick follow-up. Sure. Uh, there's been a big uh, increase in San Antonio. Are you surging uh, to help the San Antonio hospitals right now? If so, how? Sure. Just so I can make sure I understand the question, are we surging to help San Antonio hospitals? Yes. I think the best person to answer that question uh, would be Dr. Zerwas. Uh, thank you, Governor, and thank you for the question. Uh, we're following all of our uh, counties very closely in terms of what might need to be the surge uh, requirements. Uh, all of our hospitals at this time have identified to us that they're still in a pre-surge state, uh, which again is in that number five category that I've shared with you before. Uh, 
different facilities will be in different levels of need out there, uh, just depending on the, the census that's driving uh, the, the particular type of patient. Uh, but all the, all the areas have, uh, have surge capacity uh, plans out there, and to the extent that they need to move into other areas or they need certain things that the state should provide, uh, the state stands ready to do that. While awaiting the next question, to explain why Dr. Zerwas answered that question as a reminder, among other things, Dr. Zerwas is in charge of what's called the supply chain operations for healthcare. That includes supply chain making sure that hospitals have all the needed equipment and supplies, including personnel and beds that are needed to respond to COVID-19. Last question. Thank you, Governor. This might be another question kind of more with either Dr. Hellerstedt or Dr. Zerwas, but um, we're hearing some concerns about hospital capacity both here in Austin, San Antonio, like John just mentioned, and also in Houston. We're wondering which state department, if any, is collecting hospital, de hospital bed availability and hospital census numbers, and do the hospitals provide those directly, and is that provided on a daily basis? So uh, you were correct. Uh, I will allow either Dr. Hellestad or Dr. Zerwas to answer that, whichever one knows the most about it. We may tag team this one. Um, the hospitals do report the, the data in. We do not receive the data necessarily at the hospital level. We tend to have it more in an aggregated level. Uh, we do have the information on in the hospitals by county, and we will have the information from uh, the, the trauma service areas. So we do keep a, a, a close eye on the number of, uh, of people who are admitted that have confirmed COVID-19, uh, uh, both to the general, what we would call medical surgical beds, as well as uh, to the ICUs. So we keep a very close eye on that capacity. And of course, uh, one of the things that is possible and is done all the time uh, in, in times when there's a lot of uh, activity in hospitals and a lot of need for care is they can uh, use that entire trauma service area as a, as a way to uh, fill the capacity uh, to meet the needs of, of patients in those areas. So to so clarify really quick, does it go, the hospitals report to their local health departments and then the health departments report to the state or what's the exact kind of order of how it, the information? They basically come to us through the, through the RAC system, through the regional advisory system. I might, I might just also address as we as we start to get uh, to a point where we realize that the census is starting to be driven more by the COVID-19 patients and concerns about bed capacity um, uh, with the commissioner's direction and, and certainly with the involvement of the governor. We, we host calls directly with healthcare CEOs on a regular basis and there's no better way to have a good understanding of where they are in terms of capacity and needs and to talk to them personally. And so. We'll do that on a very regular basis. I've done it here in the Austin area with people that predominantly serve this area, but, but have done that in each of the regions out there. Uh, and the Texas Hospital Association has frequently been helpful to try to you know, orchestrate some of these uh, conference calls together. Uh, I have found that uh, very, very helpful. And, and just today I've been on the call uh, with a couple of big CEO uh, or big, big healthcare systems in the Houston area to talk about uh, where are you? What are your needs? Where do you think you're going over the next few days? What does the state need to do to line up behind you? While awaiting the next question, let me just elaborate on that a little bit, and that is last week I had the opportunity to speak with hospital CEOs from across the entire state of Texas, including all of the large urban areas, to get a more in-depth feel for their ability to maintain availability for anybody test positive for COVID-19, and, and I was assured and reassured consistently by all the CEOs from all regions in, in the entire state of Texas, uh, they had uh, the capability and the flexibility uh, to ensure that anybody who test positive with COVID-19 would have a bed available. They are professionals at maintaining uh, hospitals and hospital bed utilization, and they know how to uh, ratchet back on the number of people who are being admitted for non-essential surgical procedures to make sure that beds are going to be available for anybody who tests positive for COVID-19. The, uh, the spikes that we see in the charts behind you all, all began around Memorial Day weekend. Um, there's another holiday coming up uh, where people gather and, and do those sort of things. 
what if anything are you doing to kind of get the word out that you know this is the reason it went up and if you don't modify your behavior it's going to go up again especially given you know uh, like a hospital administrator i talked to today saying he's seeing an inconsistent message from leaders at every level of government some say this some say that some some politicize the mask you know it's a badge of honor not to wear one uh, how can you kind of overcome you know, the uh the, the resistance and and bring people uh, so you, you asked several things in that. Uh, let me try to answer at least two of the questions I heard. Uh, one thing that I think you were talking about is we have another holiday coming up, 4th of July. And if you go back to my executive orders, it, it does allow gatherings for 4th of July. Uh, what it also provides, however, is it, it provides uh, local flexibility with regard to setting the standards uh, for gatherings of 500 people or more that could show up to events like 4th of July events. Already, I've seen multiple stories from multiple counties across the state of Texas that are limiting uh, the outdoor gatherings for 4th of July celebrations, limiting or canceling parades they have historically had, as well as some other activities. I think that many of them would like to have a fireworks show, uh, but they want to structure it in ways that minimize uh, the potential spread of COVID-19. So the good news is, we're already seeing responses from local officials. Second, we speak to local officials typically on a weekly basis. Some questions like this typically come up. And um, as these numbers have and continue to increase, uh, we will increasingly let them know uh, that the more they are doing uh, to reduce gatherings and the size of gatherings, uh, the more they will be able to contain the spread of COVID-19. The last thing you asked about was a level of consistency uh, with regard to masks. And I think people could understand that if you look at these charts, it would have been one thing to talk about masks in the middle part of May when it looks like all the trends are going down. It's a different thing talking about masks today in the middle part of June with all of the numbers going up. As a result, you are seeing myself both wear a mask and talk about masks more than I did in the middle part of May. And similarly, you're seeing uh, an increased uh, vocalization on the local side to make sure that people are wearing masks. And there's a, a, a very important reason for that. And that's because uh, additional scientific and medical data have shown that wearing a mask is one of the most effective ways to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And so what my urging is, is this, and I'll just share with you a conversation that I had with a business person in the state of Texas who uh, wasn't all that excited about wearing a mask. This person is in the hospitality business and said that wearing a mask really doesn't fit well with the hospitality business. And as we talked through it, as the understanding began to coalesce that if we do not start wearing masks to slow the spread of COVID-19, it could result in that business actually having to close back down. And at that point in time, that business owner recognized that he embraced the utilization of masks because it ensured that he was gonna be able to keep his business open. Our goal is to keep businesses open, to keep society engaged. And one of the most effective tools that we can do that is by people wearing masks. This is not gonna be a permanent assignment. Hopefully it will be a temporary requirement one that will get us to that next level when we have treatments that will respond to COVID-19. Follow up if I may. Sure. Um, in that resistance was the, uh, the recorded conversation uh, we heard. It was directed rather personally offensive to you uh, on a number of levels. Um, do you have a message back to, to, to the people who talk like that, uh, whether it's personal or as governor of Texas? It reveals a lot about an organization's uh, morals and character, that they would use vulgarity to talk about someone in a wheelchair. And I think the public should judge that organization uh, and the positions it takes through the, the lens of the people who act that way. Thank you, Governor. Um, you know, you're saying today you're recommending for Texans to stay at home as much as they can. Um, and back in the spring, you had you, you had announced that you were going to be expanding early voting, um, thinking that the curve will have flattened by the time the primary came around. 
Uh, but now with early voting starting next week and we're seeing these spikes, do you still think it's safe for Texans to be voting in person? I do for several reasons. One is I increased the length of time for early voting so that more people would have a longer period of time to, together for the purpose of voting, meaning that they could go into voting sites with them being less crowded. Second, as we are talking about today, it is important for people to wear masks when they go out, especially in congregated areas like a potential voting location. And so we believe that uh, if people uh, take the time to vote early and when they do so wear a mask, it really shouldn't pose much of a problem with regard to being exposed to COVID-19. Any more? Thank you, Governor. Um, depending on whether Texas can flatten its curve of infection rates, could you see yourself, you know, you said that uh, shutting down completely is a last resort, but would you consider maybe scaling back some of your phased reopenings, or how close are we to having to do that? Again, the important thing is to follow the data. And as we continue to monitor all of these three metrics that are on these charts behind me, uh, we, we need to evaluate what is the effect of the additional wearing of masks, uh, cracking down on uh, places that are not following the protocols that have been established in here, making sure that everyone is following the best standards to reduce the spread of COVID-19. I believe that if, if these protocols are followed, uh, if people uh, return to the practices that we adopted a couple of months ago to slow the spread, I think we will be able to curtail this expense. That said, we, we remain flexible with regard to implementing additional strategies, if needed, uh, to make sure that we do contain the coronavirus. Let me emphasize this, and, and that is, you know, looking back at these charts, uh, the, the way that hospitalizations are spiking, the way that daily new cases are spiking. Surely the public can understand that if those spikes continue, additional measures are going to be necessary to make sure that we maintain the health and safety of the people of the state of Texas. There's been pretty, in each of these three categories, there's been pretty much a doubling of the numbers in those three categories. If we were to experience another doubling of those numbers over the next month, that would mean that we are in an urgent situation where tougher actions will be required to make sure that we do contain the spread of COVID-19. Listening in on Governor Greg Abbott and a uh, fairly lengthy press conference where we heard not only from the governor, but we also heard from uh, other state leaders and officials who uh, were with him in, in this fight against coronavirus. I think the big headline and the takeaway uh, in the governor's words today, COVID-19 is spreading at an unacceptable rate in Texas. So today, a live press conference from the governor uh, saying that, yes, he recognizes the numbers that we have all seen, that we have reported. For instance, the back half of May, the state of Texas. Texas averaged in the neighborhood of 15 new diagnosed cases per day. Uh, here we are now 22 days into June. That number has more than doubled, 3,500 diagnosed cases a day. And then on the hospitalization side, which is another key indicator that health officials and leaders are looking at, hospitalizations in May, 1,600 a day across the state. And we have now officially doubled that number 22 days into June, 3,200. And to quote the governor just a moment ago, he said, if we double that number a month from now that we're seeing at the current moment, he called that an urgent situation. So the governor is calling basically on all Texans to step up. His words work collaboratively. Remember where we were, stay at home when you can, sanitize, six feet distance uh, almost at all costs, and also face coverings. And again, he addressed mandatory versus him not choosing to, to, uh, to do a blanket mask across the state of Texas. And he uh, talked once again, as he has many times, there are certain counties and cities where huge population centers, it makes a whole lot more sense versus, in his opinion, uh, a county or a city that is not dealing with a whole lot of COVID cases. That's his 
rationalization, so no statewide mandate on masks from the governor, and that's his rationalization today. A lot to unpack there. We will continue uh, as we go through this afternoon. Please join us on CBSN, DFW. Also, we'll see you for CBS 11 News beginning at 4 o'clock this afternoon. For now, for all of us here at CBS 11, I'm Doug Dunbar. This has been a special report. We'll now send you back to regular programming.